Part four, section two of Ainu Folk Tales by Basil Hall Chamberlain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part four, Miscellaneous Tales, section two. Tale thirty eight buying a dream a certain thickly populated village was governed by six chiefs the oldest of whom lorded it over the other five one day he made a feast brewed some rice beer and invited the other five chiefs and feasted them when they were departing he said to-morrow each of you must tell me the dream which he shall have dreamt overnight and if it is a good dream i will buy it so next day four of the chiefs came and told their dreams but they were all bad dreams not worth buying the fifth however did not come though he was waited for at first and then sent for several times at last when brought by force he would not open his lips so the senior chief flew into a rage and caused a hole to be dug in front of the door of his own house and had the man buried in it up to his chin and left there all that day and night now the truth was that the senior chief was a bad man that the junior chief was a good man and that this junior chief had forgotten his dream but did not dare to say so after dark a kind god the god of the privy came and said you are a good man i am sorry for you and will take you out of the hole this he did and at that very moment the chief remembered how he had dreamt of having been led up the bank of a stream through the woods to the house of a goddess who smiled beautifully and whose room was carpeted with skins how she had comforted him fed him plenteously and sent him home in gorgeous array and with instructions for deceiving and killing his enemy the senior chief i suppose you remember it all now said the god of the privy it was i who caused you to forget it and thus saved you from having it bought by the wicked senior chief because i am pleased with the way in which you keep the privy clean not even letting grass grow near it and now i will show you the reality of that of which before you saw only the dream image so the man was led up the bank of a stream through the woods to the house of the goddess who smiled beautifully and whose room was carpeted with skins she was the badger goddess she comforted him fed him plenteously and said you must deceive the senior chief saying that the god of doorposts pleased at your being buried near him took you out and gave you these beautiful clothes he will then wish to have the same thing happen to him so the man went back to the village and appeared in all his splendid raiment before the senior chief who had fancied him to be still in the hole a punishment which would be successful if it made him confess his dream and also if it killed him then the good junior chief told him the lies in which the badger goddess had instructed him thereupon the senior chief caused himself to be buried in like fashion up to the neck but soon died of the effects afterwards the badger goddess came down to the village and married the good man who became the senior of all the chiefs written down from memory told by ishanashta sixteenth november eighteen eighty six tale thirty nine the baby and the box there was once a woman who was tenderly loved by her husband at last after some years she bore him a son then the father loved this son even more than he loved his wife she therefore thought thus how pleasant it used to be formerly when my husband loved me alone but now since i have borne him this nasty child he loves it more than he does me it will be well for me to make away with it thus thinking she waited till her husband had gone off bear hunting in the mountains and then put the baby into a box which she took to the river and allowed to float away then she returned home later on her husband came back and she with feigned tears told him that the baby had disappeared stolen or strayed and that she had vainly searched all round about the house and in the woods the man lay down like to die of grief and refused all food only at length when he saw that his wife too went without her food did he begin to eat a little fearing in his affection for her that she too might die of hunger however it was only when he was present that she fasted she ate her fill behind his back at last one day not knowing what to do to rouse him she said to him look here i will divert you with a story then she told him the whole story exactly as it had happened being herself all the while under the delusion that she was telling him an ancient fairy tale 
Then he flew into a rage, took his bludgeon, beat her to death, and then threw her corpse out of doors. This was the way in which the gods chose to punish her. Then the husband, knowing now that his search must be made down the stream, started off. At last, after seeking for a long time, he came to a lonely house, where he found a very venerable-looking old man, an old woman, and their middle-aged daughter, and also a boy. He said to the old man, I come to ask whether you know anything of my little boy, who was placed in a box and set to float down the stream. The old man replied, One day, when my daughter here went to draw water from the river, she found a box with a little boy in it. We knew not whether the child was a human creature, a god, or a devil. So doubtless he is yours. We have kept the box, too. Here it is. You can judge by looking at it. It turned out to be the same box and the same boy. So the father rejoiced. Then the old man said, Remain here. I will give to you for wife this daughter of mine, my only child. Live with us as long as my old wife and I remain alive. Feed us, and then you shall inherit from me. The man did so. When the old people died, he inherited all their possessions, and then, with his new wife and his beloved son, returned to his own village. So you see that even among us Ainus there are wicked women. Written down from memory, told by Ishanashta, 17th November, 1886. Tale 40. The Bride Bewitched. There was once a very beautiful girl who had many suitors. But as soon as she was married to one, and he lay down beside her, and then stretched out his hand towards her vagina, a voice came from it warning him to desist. This so much alarmed the bridegroom that he fled. This happened nine or ten times, till at last the girl was in despair, for none would now wed her, and her old father was put to shame. They plunged her into the water of the river, but it had no effect. So at last, in her grief, she ran to the mountains, and threw herself down at the foot of a magnolia tree. When after some difficulty she fell asleep, she dreamt that the tree was a house, outside of which she was lying, and from the window of which a lovely goddess popped out her head and said, What has happened is in no way your fault. Your beauty has caused a wicked fox to fall in love with you. It is he who has got into your vagina, and who speaks out of it, in order to prevent the approach of any ordinary mortal husband. He, too, it is, who has lured you out here to carry you away altogether. But do not allow yourself to become subject to his influence. I will give you some beautiful clothes and cause you to reach your house in safety. You must tell your father all about me. Then the girl awoke and went home. Her father exorcised the fox at last by carving an exact likeness of his daughter and offering it to the fox with respectful worship. Then she married and gave birth to children and was happy all her life. Written down from memory. Told by Ishanashta, 17th November, 1886. Tale 41. The Wicked Stepmother. In ancient days, when men were allowed to have several wives, a certain man had two, one about his own age, the other quite young, and he loved them both with equal tenderness. But when the younger of the two bore him a daughter, his love for his daughter made him also perhaps a little fonder of the mother of the child than of his other wife, to the latter's great rage. She revolved in her mind what to do, and at last feigned a grave illness, pretending not to be able even to eat, though she did eat when everybody's back was turned. At last, being to all appearance on the point of death, she declared that one thing alone could cure her. She must have the heart of her little stepchild to eat. On hearing this, the man felt very sad and knew not what to do, for he loved this wicked wife of his and his little daughter equally dearly. But at last he decided that he might more easily get another daughter than another wife, whom he would love as much as he did this one. So he commanded two of his servants to carry off the child to the forest while her mother was not looking, to slay her there and bring back her heart. So they took her. But being merciful men, they slew instead of her a dog that came by that way and brought the child back secretly to her mother, who was much frightened to hear what had happened and who fled with the child. Meanwhile, the dog's heart was brought to the stepmother, who was so overjoyed at the sight of it that she declared she required no more. 
so without even eating it she left off pretending to be sick for some time after this she lived alone with her husband but at last he was told of what had happened and he grew very sullen she seeing this wished for a livelier husband so one day when her husband was out hunting a young man beautifully dressed all in black came and courted her and she flirted with him and showed him her breasts then they fled together and came to a beautiful house with gold mats where they slept together but when she woke in the morning it was not a house at all but a rubble of leaves and branches in the midst of the forest and her new husband was nothing but a carrion crow perching overhead and her own body too was turned into a crow's and she had to eat dung but the former husband was warned in a dream to take back his younger wife and his child and the three lived happily together ever after from that time forward most men have left off the bad habit of having more than one wife written down from memory told by ishanashte november eighteen eighty six tale forty two the clever deceiver a long long time ago there was a rascal who went to the mountains to fetch wood as he did not know how to amuse himself he climbed to the top of a very thick pine tree having munched some rice he stuck it about the branches of the tree so as to make it look like bird's dung then he went back to the village to the house of the chief and spoke thus to him i have found a place where a beautiful peacock has its nest let us go there together being such a poor man i feel myself unworthy of going too near the divine bird you being a rich man should take the peacock it will be a great treasure for you let us go so the chief went there with him when the chief looked there truly were many traces of bird's dung near the top of the tall pine tree he thought the peacock was there so he said i do not know how to climb trees though you are a poor man you do know how to do so so go and get the peacock and i will reward you well go and get the divine peacock so the poor man climbed the tree when he was halfway up he said oh sir your house seems to be on fire the chief was much frightened owing to his being frightened he was about to run home then the rascal spoke thus by this time your house is quite burnt down there is no use in your running there the rich man thought he would go anywhere to die so he went towards the mountains after he had gone a short way he thought thus you should go and see even the traces of your burnt house so he went down there when he looked he found that his house was not burnt at all he was very angry and wanted to kill that rascal then the rascal came down the chief commanded his servants saying you fellows this man is not only poor but a very badly behaved deceiver put him into a mat and roll him up in it without killing him then throw him into the river do this thus spoke the chief the servants put the rascal into the mat and tied it round tight then two of them carried him between them on a pole to the river bank they went to the river the rascal spoke thus though i am a very bad man i have some very precious treasures do you go and fetch them if you do so it can be arranged about their being given to you afterwards you can throw me into the river hearing this the two servants went off to the rascal's house meanwhile a blind old man came along from somewhere or other his foot struck against something wrapped up in a mat astonished at this he tapped it with his stick then the rascal said blind man if you will do as i tell you the gods will give you eyes and you will be able to see so do so if you will untie me and do as i tell you i will pray to the gods and your eyes will be opened the blind old man was very glad he untied the mat and let the rascal out then the rascal saw that though the man was old and blind he was dressed very much like a god the rascal said take off your clothes and become naked whereupon your eyes will quickly be opened this being so the blind old man took off his clothes then the rascal put him naked into the mat and tied it round tight then he went off with the clothes and hid shortly afterwards the two men came and said you rascal you are truly a deceiver so though you possess no treasures you possess plenty of deceit so now we shall fling you into the water the blind old man said i am a blind old man i am not that rascal please do not kill me but he was forthwith flung into the river afterwards the two men went home to their master's house 
afterwards the rascal put on the blind old man's beautiful clothes then he went to the chief's house and said my appearance of misbehaviour was not real the goddess who lives in the river was very much in love with me so she wanted to take and marry my spirit after i should have been killed by being thrown into the river so my misdeeds are all her doing though i went to that goddess i felt unworthy to become her husband because i am a poor man i have arranged so that you who are the chief of the village should go and have her and i have come to tell you so that being so i am in these beautiful clothes because i come from the goddess thus he spoke as the chief of the village saw that the rascal was dressed in nothing but the best clothes and thought that he was speaking the truth he said it will be well for me to be tied up in a mat and flung into the river therefore this was done just as had been done with the rascal and he was drowned in the water after that the rascal became the chief and dwelt in the drowned chief's house thus very bad men lived in ancient times also so it is said translated literally told by ishanashte eighteenth july eighteen eighty six tale forty three Yoshitsune. it has been generally believed both by japanese and europeans who have written about the ainus that the latter worship yoshitsune a japanese hero of the twelfth century who is said not indeed by japanese historians but by japanese tradition to have fled to yezo when the star of his fortune had set the following details concerning yoshitsune bear so completely the stamp of the myth that they may perhaps be allowed a place in this collection it should be mentioned that yoshitsune is known to the ainus under the name of hongai sama sama is the japanese for mr or lord hongai is the form in which according to a regular law of permutation affecting words adopted into ainu from japanese the word hogwan which was yoshitsune's official title appears the name of hongai sama is however used only in worship not in the recounting of the myth mr bachelor whose position as missionary to the ainus must give his opinion great weight in such matters thinks that the ainus do not worship yoshitsune but i can only exactly record that which i was told myself okikurumi accompanied by his younger sister tureshi had taught the ainus all arts such as hunting with the bow and arrow netting and spearing fish and many more and himself knew everything by means of two charms or treasures one of these was a piece of writing the other was an abacus and they told him whence the wind would blow how many birds there were in the forest and all sorts of other things one day there came none knew whence a man of divine appearance whose name was unknown to all he took up his abode with okikurumi and assisted the latter in all his labour with wonderful ability he taught okikurumi how to row with two oars instead of simply poling with one pole as had been usual before in ainu land okikurumi was delighted to obtain such a clever follower and gave him his sister tureshi in marriage and treated him like his own son for this reason the stranger got to know all about okikurumi's affair even the place where he kept his two treasures the result of this was that one day when okikurumi was out hunting in the mountains the stranger stole these treasures and all that okikurumi possessed and then fled with his wife tureshi in a boat of which they each pulled an oar okikurumi returned from the mountains to his home by the seaside and pursued them alone in a boat but could not come up to them because he was only one against two then tureshi excreted some large feces in the middle of the sea which became a large mountain in the sea at whose base okikurumi arrived but so high was it that okikurumi could not climb over it moreover even had not the height prevented him the fact of its being nothing but filthy feces would have done so as for going round either side of it that would have taken him too much out of the way so he went home again feeling quite spiritless and vanquished because robbed of his treasures this is the reason why ever since we ainus have not been able to read written down from memory told by ishinashte twenty fifth november eighteen eighty six End of part four recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine.
Part five of Ainu Folk Tales by Basil Hall Chamberlain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part five Scraps of Folklore. Tale forty four The Good Old Times. In ancient days, rivers were very conveniently arranged. The water flowed down one bank and up the other, so that you could go either way without the least trouble. Those were the days of magic. People were then able to fly six or seven miles, and to light on the trees like birds when they went out hunting. But now the world is decrepit, and all good things are gone. In those days people used the fire drill. Also, if they planted anything in the morning, it grew up by midday. On the other hand, those who ate of this quickly produced grain were transformed into horses. Written down from memory. Told by Ishanashte, November 1886 tale forty five the old man of the sea the old man of the sea atuikoro ekashi is a monster able to swallow ships and whales in shape it resembles a bag and the suction of its mouth causes a frightfully rapid current once a boat was saved from this monster by one of the two sailors in it flinging his loincloth into the creature's open mouth that was too nasty a morsel for even this monster to swallow so it let go its hold of the boat. Written down from memory. Told by Ishanashte, July, 1886. Tale 46. The Cuckoo. The male cuckoo is called Kakok, the female Tutut. Both are beautiful birds and live in the sky. But in spring they come down to earth to build their beautiful bottle-shaped white nests. Happy the man who gets one of these nests and lets no one else see it he will become rich and prosperous nevertheless it is unlucky for a cuckoo to light on the window-sill and look into the house for disease will come there if it lights on the roof the house will be burnt down written down from memory told by penri sixteenth july eighteen eighty six tale forty seven the horned owl there are six owls brethren the eldest of them is only a little bigger than a sparrow. When perching on a tree, it balances itself backwards, for which reason it is called the faller backwards. The youngest of the six has a very large body. It is a bird which brings great luck. If anyone walks beneath this bird and there comes a sound of rain falling on him, it is a very lucky thing, for such a man will become very rich. For this reason, the youngest of the six owls is called Mr. Owl the rain here mentioned is supposed to be a rain of gold from the owl's eyes translated literally told by penry sixteenth july eighteen eighty six tale forty eight the peacock in the sky a cloudless sky has a peacock in it whose servants are the eagles the peacock lives in the sky and only descends to earth to give birth to its young when it has borne one it flies back with it to the sky written down from memory told by penris july eighteen eighty six and by ishanashta november eighteen eighty six tale forty nine trees turned into bears the rotten branches or roots of trees sometimes turn into bears such bears as these are termed payap kamui that is divine walking creatures and are not to be killed by human hand Formerly they were more numerous than they are now, but they are still sometimes to be seen. Written down from memory. Told by Penry, July 1886. Tale 50. Coition. The Ainus think it very unlucky for the woman to move ever so slightly during the act of coition. If she does so, she brings disasters upon her husband, who is sure to become a poor man. For this reason, the woman remains absolutely quiet, and the man alone moves. Written down from memory. Told by Penry, July 1886. Tale 51. Birth and Naming. Before birth, clothes are got ready for the expected baby, who is washed as soon as born. The divine symbols are set up, and thanks are offered to the gods. Only women are present on the occasion generally in each village there are one or two old women who act as midwives the child may be named at any time ishanashta said that it was usually two or three months 
Penury said it was two or three years after birth. The name chosen is usually founded on some circumstance connected with the child, but sometimes it is meaningless. The parent's name is never given, for that would be unlucky. How indeed could a child continue to be called by such a name when his father had become a dead man, and consequently one not to be mentioned without tears? Written down from memory. Told by Penri and Ishinashte, July 1886. Tale 52. The Preeminence of the Oak, Pine Tree, and Mugwort. At the beginning of the world the ground was very hot. The ground was so hot that the creatures called men even got their feet burnt. For this reason no tree or herb could grow. The only herb that grew at that time was the mugwort. Of trees the only one were the oak and the pine. For this reason these two trees are the oldest among trees. Among herbs it is the mugwort. This being so, these two trees are divine trees. They are trees which human beings worship among herbs the mugwort is considered to be truly the oldest listen well to this too you younger folks translated literally told by penry nineteenth july eighteen eighty six tale fifty three the deer with a golden horn a specimen of ainu history my very earliest ancestor kept a deer he used to tie the divine symbols to its horns then the deer would go to the mountains and bring down with it plenty of other deer when they came outside the house my ancestor would kill the deer which his deer had brought from the mountains and thus was greatly enriched the name of the village in which that deer was kept was setarukot there was a festival at a neighbouring village so the man who kept the deer went off thither to the festival with all his followers only his wife was left behind with the deer then a man called tun owush that is as tall as two men from the village of shipichara being very bad-hearted came in order to steal that deer he found only the deer and the woman at home he stole both the woman and the deer and ran away with them so the man who kept the deer becoming angry pursued after him to fight him being three brothers in all they went off all three together so tun owush invoked the aid of the whole neighbourhood he called together a great number of men then those three brethren came together to fight him as they were three of them the eldest having killed threescore men was at last killed himself the second brother killed fourscore men and was then killed himself then the youngest brother seeing how things were thought it would be useless to go on fighting alone for this reason he ran away having run away he got home having got home he came to his house then he invoked the aid of all the neighborhood he invoked the aid even of those ainus who dwelt in the land of the japanese then he went off with plenty of men having gone off he fought against tun uwo ush in the war he killed tun uwo ush and all his followers then he got back both the deer and the woman that was the last of the ainu wars translated literally told by ishinashte eighth november eighteen eighty six tale fifty four dreams to dream of rice beer a river swimming or anything connected with liquids causes rainy weather for instance i dreamt last night that i was drinking rice beer and accordingly it is raining today to dream of eating meat brings disease so does dreaming of eating sugar or anything red to dream of killing or knocking a man down is lucky to dream of being killed or knocked down is unlucky to dream that a heavy load which one is carrying feels light is lucky. The contrary dream prognosticates disease. To dream of a long rope which does not break, and in which there are no knots even when it is wound up, is lucky, and prognosticates victory. To dream of flying like a bird and perching on a tree prognosticates rain and bad weather. When a man is about to start off hunting, it is very lucky for him to dream of meeting a god in the mountains, to whom he gives presents and to whom he makes obeisance. After such a dream he is certain to kill a bear. To dream of being pursued with a sharp weapon is unlucky. To dream that one is wounded and bleeding freely is a good omen for the chase. To dream of the sun and moon is probably unlucky, especially if one dreams of the waning moon. 
but it is not unlucky to dream of the new moon to dream of a bridge breaking is unlucky but to dream of crossing a bridge in safety is lucky for a husband to dream of his absent wife as smiling well-dressed or sleeping with himself is unlucky written down from memory told by ishanashta november eighteen eighty six end of part five scraps of folklore recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of ainu folk tales by basil hall chamberlain